Hi, this is Mike from Mike's Unboxing Reviews and How To, and on today's video, we'll be taking a look at the Gigabyte A320M H, an ultra budget motherboard which might just be suitable for your next build. Keep watching to find out more. Okay, so the first thing in this video which we really, really need to address is the fact that this is ridiculously cheap. Now, at the moment in the UK, this is retailing for under £20. Yes, you heard that right, under £20. This on Amazon was £19.99, and also there is other vendors in the UK, such as CCL Scan, etc., which are all doing it for a very similar price. But obviously, if you're an Amazon shopper and you've got Prime, then yeah, it makes a lot of sense to get it from Amazon. All the links for this will be provided in the description below so you can check out the latest pricing in your local area. So with that out of the way, let's take a look at this board. Now obviously, this isn't a high-end board. Clearly, the fact it's £20 or thereabouts gives you some idea of what this is capable of. But certainly, for some people, if you're looking for an ultra-budget board for a very modest system, or even if you've got a slightly older processor and you just want to build up a little system for a little bit of light gaming, some education work, whatever the case may be, this is definitely worth a look, again, especially at £20. So we'll do a quick tour of the packaging, take a look at see what we get inside, then we'll do a detailed tour of all the connectivity on the board, and then at the end we'll come back with my final thoughts. We will actually later on be doing a build with this particular board in a, a budget setup, so if you want to see how that goes, don't forget to click on the subscribe button and the chime icon to stay notified of future video releases. So with all that said, let's take a look at the, uh, the packaging and see what we actually get. So as you can see, this is the Gigabyte UD Ultra Durable 8320M-H. This is a AMD A320 chipset. So along with the uh, the budget price, we also get a budget feature set. Now straight out of the gate, this board will not support any form of overclocking. It will, however, allow you to use things like Precision Boost Overdrive, and also you will be allowed to use XMP profile settings on your memory. Other than that, that is it. Now we will be taking a deep dive into the BIOS, although there's not a lot of BIOS to take a look at, but certainly we'll be doing that in a follow-up video, so if you want to see how that goes, there'll be links for that in the video description also. Now we were really lucky, well, I guess really lucky, this is actually version 3 of the board. There's actually three revisions. You can tell the different revisions actually just by the packaging. Uh, I'll show you some pictures on the screen now so you can see what those different ones look like. Essentially, the last revision is, yeah, the end of the road. This is an EOL product, or end of line. So you may find things like support online, on Gigabyte's website, etc., may be slightly limited. And in fact, even today, going over to Gigabyte's site, looking at the BIOS updates, clicking on the support tab, I get a 404 page not found. So yeah, you may have to buy this board and take it with a grain of salt that you will get any backup or support later on down the line. As it comes straight out of the box, we do have the AMD Ryzen 3000 series ready. This is gonna be the end of the line for this board again, like I kind of mentioned earlier. 5000 series probably will never ever work on this board and also things like the 4000 series which are more of an OEM product possibly might get support later on down the line but I would say realistically if you temper your expectations to be in the 3000 series as being the end of the line and it does actually support straight out of the box the Ryzen 9 3950X. Now whether or not that is an ideal solution to go with that particular processor I would say probably not but officially it will work. This board really is aimed at the kind of the lower end, so any of the A-series or Athlon processors on the AM4 socket. Also things like your APUs, such as the 3000G, 2200G, 2400G, 3200G and 3400G are all going to be excellent choices to run with this particular setup. Going over to the back of the box, it gives you some more idea of some of the specifications. Now there isn't a great deal, obviously this is the A320 chipset, so uh, we're not going to be blown away with specifications. But it will actually support PCI Express Generation 3 on the primary 16 times slot. Underneath that, we've got a couple of PCI Express Gen 2 times 1 ports. So again, there isn't a whole load of flexibility, but if you want to put a medium-sized graphics card in there, you should be absolutely fine. Obviously, PCI Express Gen 4 cards will run at PCI Express Gen 3 speeds, but probably not ideal. Again, going back to what I said earlier, APU support is pretty where this board is uh, firmly aimed, but if you wanted to add a graphics card at later that you can do, something like a GTX 1070, something along those lines, will be absolutely fine. Also on the PCI Express bus, we do have a M.2 slot. Now the M.2 slot is gonna differ depending on what processor you actually put on it. If you're using a older A-series or Athlon style AM4 processor, then the M.2 slot is gonna be limited to SATA only support. If you're using a more modern Ryzen processor, then there's a very strong chance you'll be able to support either a SATA-based drive 
or a M.2 PCI Express NVMe Gen 3 drive at the times four speeds or possibly times two. Again, depending on the processor, your speeds may vary. Also supported on this board are a couple of fan headers. Yep, sadly, there's only two fan headers and one of which is the CPU fan header. So don't be expecting to buy this and deck it out with a ton of fans. Obviously, if you want to add more fans or if you're using a case which has got a built-in fan hub, then it isn't going to be a problem at all. Just plug it into the chassis fan header and you're off to the races. Another upside of this board is, well, a potential upside is the audio. So we actually got some pretty decent Nippon audio capacitors on here. So the sound quality, although it's not going to be amazing, will certainly get the job done. Also, you've got other things like humidity protection on the PCB and all those kind of relatively modern features. The VRM setup on this isn't brilliant. There is a hybrid VRM, which is split into a 4 plus 2 setup. Again, this is a budget board. It is A320, so we don't have any form of overclocking, only that precision boost overdrive. So yeah, you're not going to be driving a processor particularly hard, but yeah, the VRMs could be a lot better, but they are satisfactory and will get the job done. I'll give you a quick close up now of the specs on the back of the box here, so you can have a quick drill through and pause the video if you want to get more information. So that's enough about the specs, let's take this thing out of the box and see what we actually get. And actually, this is a very, very OEM type setup. So in this little flap here, we are greeted with a pair of SATA cables, one with right angle, one with straight. And also we do have the standard kind of uh, yeah, piece of metal IO shield on the back. Obviously for this price point, we wouldn't expect an integrated one. And the fact we actually get one is pretty decent at this price. Obviously also in the box, we get the motherboard itself, which we'll take a closer look at shortly. And we get some paperwork and also a DVD. So there is a gigabyte quick install guide. We've got a driver DVD and also a multilingual installation guide. So finally, we get to the part where we actually take a look at the motherboard itself. And this is a micro ATX board. For those of you who are not aware, when it comes to motherboards, normally the actual M in the title relates to the size of the board. So if this was an A320, generally it's going to be an ATX. If it's an A320M, then there's a very strong chance it's a micro ATX. So if you're looking for a micro ATX board, always look out for the M on the end of the chipset name. Anyway, moving on. So connectivity wise in the top left hand corner, we've got an eight pin EPS connector, which is actually a, a really good sign. If it was only a four pin, that is gonna mean that it's not gonna be able to draw that much power. Certainly with the eight pin, it does give you a little bit more uh, potential performance. Underneath that, we've got our VRM setup. So again, that's a four plus two setup, digital hybrid VRM. Not entirely sure of the exact specs of that. They don't list it on the website and there isn't really a great deal to see there, but certainly I'll give you a close up so you can see what they look like a little bit better. Moving across from that, we've got our standard AM4 socket setup. Again, support for CPUs from the A series, Athlon series, Ryzen series, anything up to the 3000 series, and that is pretty much where it ends. Moving across at the top, we've got our CPU fan header in a pretty convenient place. And next to that, we've got a pair of RAM slots. Sadly, only two slots on this. Again, it would be better to have four if possible, but generally I think most people who are gonna be getting this is gonna be a budget build. Are you gonna buy four sticks of RAM for a budget build? I think it's probably unlikely, and again, for the OEMs that are using this, they don't necessarily need to give you an upgrade path going forward. As long as you can actually put dual channel RAM in, you're good to go. Now, RAM speed support is gonna be a little bit hit and miss depending on what processor you're using and what setup. In the best possible case scenario, if you're using a 3000 series processor, then you're likely to get 3200 DDR speeds out of this. If you're running anything a little bit lower, potentially, yes, you're gonna be topping out maybe 2666, 2933, etc. It would be nice if this went actually up to 3600 or even above that. Again, we will be doing some tests with this a little bit later on and I will see what we can actually get out of it. But officially, as far as the specs go, this is limited to DDR4 3200 speeds. Moving across, nothing much of interest up here. Would have been nice to have seen a diagnostic LED. So if you get a no boot situation, you can work out what has gone wrong. But underneath that, there is the standard 24 pin ATX connector. And further on down, we've got our connectivity for our SATA drive. So you can connect up to four SATA drives on here. Obviously, if you're choosing not to use the M.2, which they generally tend to be a little bit more expensive. So if you've got some cheaper, older SATA drives, then you can connect those up, no problems at all. Moving back across to this side, we've got our other fan header, which is yeah, in a relatively convenient place for rear mounted exhaust fans, that kind of thing. Obviously, if you are mounting other fans in here, then you're gonna have to think about how you're gonna wire a splitter from there or yeah, however you set it up. Could be a little bit problematic for those front facing fans on certain cases. Again, if you're using a case which has got a built-in fan controller or a remote control, then it's not really something you need to worry about. 
So just across from that, we've got our M.2 slot, as I said, support for SATA and NVMe based drives up to PCI Express Gen 3 times 4 Again, depending on the processor you're using, your speeds may vary. Underneath that, we've got our PCI Express Gen 3 times 16 slot, which is fully wired. And underneath that, there is a pair of PCI Express Gen 2 times 1 ports. We've got our chipset cooler at the bottom here, and then we go down to our I.O. section. So on the I.O. section, we've got our USB 3.0, which is USB 3.1 Gen 1. Next to that, we've got our front panel I.O. connection, which will give you an exploded view so you can see how the connectors go on to that. Next to that, there's a weird thing that says clear CMOS, but it doesn't appear to be. That's a four pin connection, which I think is actually for some kind of speed if, but not entirely sure. The manual isn't particularly clear on that either. Above that, there's a four pin connector for connecting up a BIOS speaker. And next to that, there is a pair of USB 2.0 port headers. Next to that is our TPM header. So that uses Gigabyte's own TPM type connection on there. So if you're looking at maybe running this with uh, Windows 11 when it comes out and there are seems to be a necessity for a TPM type device. If you don't have one built into your processor, which is probably quite unlikely, you can of course use a different TPM style connector on there to give you that facility in the operating system. Moving across from that, we've got our CMOS reset switch. So that's a two pin, just short out if you want to clear the CMOS. Obviously the CMOS battery is there, so if you want to you can just take the battery out and reset it from there. And last of all, we've got our HD audio connector. So this is HD audio. It does support up to 7.1 audio, although on the back there's only three connections, so essentially that's a 5.1. If you do want to enable 7.1, you do need to use your front panel connectors and in the software actually convert it so they all work as the correct channels. Using Nippon semiconductor caps on there, so that's a pretty good sign. And it's using the Realtek ALC897 chipset, so yeah, not brilliant, but we'll get the job done. Moving on to the back of the motherboard, looking at the I.O. So we've got a keyboard and mouse port, which is uh, quite unusual these days. We also get a DVI-D port. So the DVI-D port is going to support 1920 by 1200 at 60 hertz. And next to that, we've got an HDMI 1.4 port. That's going to support up to 1496 by 2196 at 24p. Obviously, if you're going slightly lower, if you're using APU, most people are probably going to go for 1080p, in which case you can get 60 hertz, no problems at all. Next up, we've got uh, four of our USB 3 ports, so that's USB 3.1 Gen 1 ports, and then there's a couple of USB 2 ports, along with our Gigabit Ethernet LAN, which is again supported by Realtek, that's the 8118 chipset, and then we've got our three audio connectors for our onboard Realtek sound. So that is pretty much it for a tour of the board and connectivity. Let's talk about who this board is aimed at. Now, obviously, if you haven't guessed already by the price of this, this is aimed firmly at the budget market. If you're looking at maybe making a cheap business PC for running in a shop 24-7 or just a very light gaming PC, this is going to be absolutely perfect. It's going to keep your costs way, way down. This is, in effect, probably about 30 to £40 pounds cheaper than the kind of equivalent B450 boards on the market at the moment. Although, having said that, the DS3H Gigabyte B450 has been seen for around about £36 pounds recently. So... That is something to bear in mind if you have got the little bit of extra cash maybe an extra 15 20 pounds you can get a board which will allow you a little bit more overclocking and four ram slots if that is something which is of interest to you then you can check out a review of that board up here so essentially it comes down to cost that is really the the end goal of this particular board it's extremely cheap it's an end of life board there's going to be very limited support going forward but it will get the job done. So if you're going for an APU, you can stick on pretty much anything you want on there, again, from the 3000G up to the 3400G, and it will just work. No need for BIOS updates, no need for configuration. Just stick it on there, build up your system, and you're off to the races. Now, my concern is, obviously, if people are going to be buying this and thinking possibly upgrading in the future, realistically, not going to happen. I can't see any further support for 5000 series. I would say that's completely off the card. So you are stuck with a limited amount of upgrades. But essentially it puts you in the same position as certain intel boards at the moment so if you're looking at 10th gen intel that is dead in the water also so if you're looking at building a budget system with onboard graphics you're looking between the two intel or amd then i think this is probably the way to go and again the intel versions aren't going to allow overclocking either so yeah for 20 pounds i don't think you can go too far wrong but let me know what you think about this one in the comments section below if you find this content useful or interesting, don't forget to give me a like and maybe share it with some of your friends who may also find it interesting. But for now, this has been the Gigabyte A320M-H. I've been Mike. This is Mike's Unboxing Reviews now too. And hopefully we'll catch you in the very next video. Thanks for watching.